Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, I would like to start off by introducing my co-coordinator of this course, uh, Alison Hewitt, who is the director of uh, social entrepreneurship at Mars. Uh, her colleague was up here at the first lecture, but Alison will be joining us for the remainder of the lectures. Um, tonight we're, um, well, first let me give you uh, a message about the layout. Um, I think you know that this room is, or many of you may know that this room is rented out uh, frequently. Uh, it's one of the ways that Mars makes money, so we can put on courses like this. Uh, tomorrow, um, it's General Electric. We have the CEO of GE, and it's a one-day special seminar uh, for empowering women employees at, uh, at GE. So it's something that we think is pretty good. And since you're all entrepreneurs, uh, we expect you to be pretty nimble on your feet or in your bums in this particular case, and you'll accommodate to whatever uh, setup that we have here. And you'll find frequently there'll be a different layout. It depends on who's in during the day or who's on first thing in, in the morning. So it, uh, if there's any great complaints, don't bother. Uh, <laughs> since we really can't afford to break this room down, uh, set up chairs and then break the chairs down and set something up uh, for first thing in the morning. And as I say, I expect you to be, you know, rocking and rolling and accommodating whatever life throws you. So tonight, business development and entrepreneurship basics. And so, um, Allison, I'll pass it on to you. And I guess we have, we actually have two. We can have dueling. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So this is uh, just a little comic strip that says, uh, as our new company logo, I'm not quite sure it's sending out the right message. And we wanted to start with this because we want you to take some time in this basics and figure out what is the right message. This is the time now to think about what options are available to you and how you take advantage of it. So by the time you get to the branding marketing experts, you get a little bit more than a question mark. Tony? Okay. So. Um, start with the basics. Um, the very first question you need to ask yourself is, why do I want to start this venture? And it sounds obvious, but as you start talking to other people, potential backers, you have to have clear in your mind, what do you want out of this? Um, do you want a lifestyle business? You'll be happy with a new Mercedes every year and some competent employees so you can get at least three rounds of golf in. Um, you know, don't go looking for venture capital money if that's your vision. Or do you want to just take on the world and revolutionize it? Get clear in your mind what you want to do. This is your enterprise. You cannot decide who to partner with if you don't really know what you want to do. Because the last thing you want to do is start out on something and say, eh, I don't really think so. Much smaller vision. You may be in too deep at that, at that stage. And corollary to that is the second point. Based on that vision, what resources do you need? Are you going to need a minimum of $20 million capital to get your product development, developed? Or can you bootstrap this? Think through what your venture to be when it grows up, and think through what resources will it need to get there. How do you fit into the rest of the world? Is there already a lot of people offering the product and the service, or do they have the skill that you're purporting to bring to the market? What makes you unique? Where do you add value into this whole equation? And what's your business model? And we're going to spend a, a good deal of time on this. So is it for profit? Is it not for profit? Is it a hybrid model? 
And what's happening in the work that I'm doing, we're going to look at a whole spectrum from a traditional charity through to a traditional corporation and look at different options in there. So you may come and think, okay, so I'm just here to make some money, or maybe if I can make a difference, that's great. But we're going to lay out for you some options, and you can see which one actually fits best with what I want to achieve. So for us, it's about the impact, and the organizational model is secondary. Okay, so on the one side, this side, you have the traditional charity. So a charity provides services. Um, traditionally, you can think about a food bank. Now, they are addressing a real and immediate need. There's someone in front of you who's hungry. You have to feed them. We're also saying it's really important to look at why they're there. We want to look at addressing underlying issues of poverty. But if someone's hungry, you've got to feed them. Then you look at the next level down, which is a nonprofit with income activities. So it's that same food bank who now says, you know, we have a really good relationship with farmers because farmers are coming in and are donating their excess food to us. And there's this huge need among restaurateurs now around local food and preparing local food. So we could be a broker. We could take on this income generating activity. So we're staying true to our mission, but we're taking on income generating by brokering these relationships between farmers and restaurateurs who want to provide local food to deal with this whole local food movement. And they begin to generate income. It's best if it's tied to your mission, but there's lots of other cases where it's not or it's closely related. So if I think, <clears throat> excuse me, think about the Y, think about the YMCA. So everybody knows that they have these fitness centers and they make money out of that, right? It's a, they, the Y does tons of other stuff, but they also make money that way. What happens is if you can afford to pay, you do, and if you can't afford to pay, you can get a subsidy, you can get it free. And it's also in line with their mission to make people healthier, more physically active. So this is the kind of options you can begin to look at. Then we look at social enterprises and socially responsible businesses. One falls slightly on the not-for-profit side, one falls slightly on the for-profit side. Both have an embedded social and or environmental mission and they're interested in making money. So this is the sweet spot for my program here at Mars. People who want to make a difference and make money. Not such a bad thing. Um, then on the other side, we start moving towards something called corporate social responsibility. And this is, again, corporations who will do things like uh, examine their value chain, right? Is it their fair trade right along the value chain, right along their supply chain? What is it that they're able to do to encourage their staff to volunteer in nonprofits and to make a difference? Do they donate money? Do they donate expertise in terms of marketing? There's a whole bunch of options. And then there's the traditional corporation, which Tony's going to talk about. And there, you know, um, obviously, as the slide says, the major if not sole driver there, is the profit-making motive. Now, the interesting thing is I think this whole spectrum is, is actually fairly new. What happens historically, you think of the great robber barons of the 1800s and early 1900s, the railroads, the oil companies. Basically, they made a ton of money and then folks like the Rockefellers donated and created libraries and uh, all sorts of things. So the tradition was basically two-step. First, you make as much money as you possibly can. And then when you've got so much you don't know what to do with it, you then give it back. And I'm making light of it, but actually, in many hands, that... Um, did a huge amount of good. And Alice and I haven't had a chance to debate this, but uh, it would be fun to think what, what people think about this. Should you basically concentrate, um, well, um, um, Bill Gates, you know, make $50 billion. You can then afford to set up a foundation that funds all sorts of things globally. And that's an interesting old model. And, and what we're seeing here is really a spectrum that um, actually attempt to do the two simultaneously. And I think that's a cool shift in things. And we'll, 
Yeah, I'll be curious. I may be blogging about this to see what your opinions are. How many people just want to make money? And, and then I'll think about doing yeah. good. And, we, and so we tend to see a lot of younger folks in particular come in and saying, you know, every day we're reading about environmental degradation. We're, we know that it's no longer an option just to make money and not care about the consequences. And if we can embrace it right now to take the social mission or the environmental right up front, then that's how we're choosing to live. So there are options for sure, but I think it's just important for you to understand that the one way that we traditionally think about is not the only way. Agreed. Um, so, so we want to talk about three main types of businesses that you could set up. It's not a perfect division, but it works. Um, first one is consulting. And again, the presumption here is that everybody here ha is coming with a particular skill set. If you're a scientist or engineer, you're doing a PhD, you've got uh, the classic um, uh, sort of very narrow, but deep domain expertise. One of the easiest businesses to create is a consulting business. And um, that can be big, there's Hatch Associates out in Sheridan Park. I think more typically that is, that lends itself to a one or two person shop. Your uh, capital costs are pretty low. You need a laptop and a phone, basically. And what a lot of people are doing now is creating virtual consulting organizations. Okay? And that means you may only be able to help in one aspect of a client's business. But you may have a colleague who can do marketing for them. And someone else, um, who uh, knows regulatory issues. So on a website, you band together. Someone looking at that thinks, wow, this is a full spectrum consulting firm. In fact, you're just an, a web, and you'll have trading arrangements that whoever brings a, a client in gets an extra cut out of the deal, and everybody else bills, and you've got one rate card. So everybody kind of shares in the deals, and you know, everybody gets more than any individual one could. Uh, scaling consulting is a challenge. Obviously, it can be done. Typically, engineering, uh, environmental consulting is a big one. But um, it's, it lends itself to somebody starting out with relatively low cost. And it can be a jumping off platform in getting into um, other um, uh, product businesses. You have great ideas, and you may eventually say, hey, you know, I could actually build that for those guys and get into business doing that. So benefits and risk, low capital cost, minimal uh, sort of input to set yourself up. Uh, cautionary note, um, you're advising people, you better have liability insurance, because if you're wrong, uh, they're going to come chasing after you. Um, and again, if you're small, you're operating with uh, very little support. Um, to the extent that you build a network, you can get, uh, you can get some. Uh, one of the things that I'm asked, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll broach it now, people say, how much should I charge? Mm -hmm. Classic question, should I charge you know, $500 a day, $1,000 a day? My answer to that is, what's the alternative cost? You're, you know, you're always up against an alternative, and this is a thread throughout everything here. They could hire somebody to do that job. Trouble is, if it only takes two months to do it, and they hire somebody, they got a commitment, they got a salary commitment. So you're looking at alternative costs. Now, there are, there's no standard scale, but what you can charge really depends on your expertise, how unique it is, and how deep it is. Not surprisingly, the longer you do it, the more you can charge because you are building up a wealth of practical experience. If you're a former president and you are a consultant, so I guess prime ministers tend to join law firms and advise clients on relationships with government. They've got unique skills, they charge. So a lot of it depends on your skill, but, but don't just think about, well, maybe I can charge $500 a day. Analyze the job uh, in hand that's you know, being proposed. 
look at what the alternative costs are, back off a certain amount. If you're the cheapest alternative, even if you're expensive, and I'm being a little aggressive, start high and negotiate low. But uh, don't be bashful about going in and saying, gee, I don't have that much experience. I can only charge two or $300 a day. I mean, every lawyer, a junior lawyer, is charging two to $300 an hour, and it goes up from there. So, um, and every company is used to paying that. If you've got domain expertise, don't be bashful, and it's like perfume. Uh, you know, if you're not selling perfume, they tell you, raise the price, because it is perceived as being that much better, so you have to have that. Hmm. Um, so I think over to you. So in the social enterprise space, uh, again, uh, not-for-profit organizations are not necessarily used to thinking about the assets that they have and how to charge for them, because it's all about service. So the um, social enterprise that I started was something called 211. It's a three-digit access to human service information. So if you've lost your wallet and you need to call around getting a new social insurance number or health card and blah, 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 and you, you don't need to go through all those different places, you can just call 211. You need a nursing home for your mom. You need daycare for a child. Any of those social services, it's just three-digit access like 911 or 411. And so this was um, a social enterprise that I started because getting access in this <clears throat> community is very challenging, especially if you're a new immigrant and you don't speak the language. It's really, really tough. So this is a, a one-stop or first-stop shopping access. So one of the things that we figured out really quickly was that there's a lot of inappropriate calls to 911. A lot of people call 911 because it's top of mind. It's not an emergency. So can we make a deal with 911 so that they can pay for some of our services if we take off their volume? Um, Children's Aid Society, they're getting calls. A lot of them are just people asking questions. I think maybe my neighbor, maybe, I'm not sure. And you know, instead of going right to the Children's Aid Society, we can do a screening for them. And also, this service runs 24-7. Um, it's now, a, it started here in Toronto, but it's now global. So it started here, and so it runs 24-7, speaks 16 different languages, depending on when you call and who you get. But what's the value in that? It's got great value. You can, you can then not only answer the call for someone in need, but you can also sell your services to other people. So look at those tangible assets you have. In some cases, it's a physical space. You've got a physical space. You can share offices with other people. You can make money that way. There's a pretty famous social enterprise here in Toronto called Eva's Phoenix. It's a training program for street-involved or homeless youth. And they've set up this whole printing program to train people in these kind of skills. And what we're doing is encouraging other social enterprises like Mars. I mean, this is a social enterprise. Encouraging Mars to use Eva's Phoenix to do their printing. Right? So you, you have a double bottom line there. You're getting a product, but you're also helping homeless people as well. So I've mentioned a couple of other things here. Uh, the sustainability office at the University of Toronto. This is a professor who has done a lot of research in the area of sustainability. And now she can consult on her services to help corporations realize how they can be much more effective in the whole value chain again. Aperio is a consulting firm. It's for profit, but its clients are exclusively not for profit. So there's a niche market there for you. The whole point of doing all of this is to in, um, get less reliance on government funding because political office changes and you're no longer the flavor of the month. So you've got to figure out how you can increase your own resilience and your own self reliance. And mission drift is a problem. Sometimes there's a really great shiny object over here you want to run after because you think you can make some money, but it can take you away from your core service. If I go back to the food bank, they can run after lots of other cool things with the grocery industry and others. They've still got to feed that hungry person in front of them. So always watching the balance. It's actually good to know that scientists are not the, and engineers are not the only one that's, ones that chase after bright, shiny objects <laughs> as they bounce in front of them, taking them off of their main business focus. Um, so service, and our motto here is service with a smile. Um, OK, so conventional service, um, the shoe shine, old business. Actually, CIBC is a service organization, a rather profitable one. Um, but it is providing a niche service to a very large population. And that's, you know, well, lending you money, paying mortgages. It all centers around you and your money and managing money for you. 
Um, a newer type of service business is Salesforce.com. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar. Basically, customer relations management. You, know, you heard last week um, uh, from Harry Rosen about he wrote those little cards down. And it wasn't just the, uh, the, um, the customer's suit size. It was where did he work? What was his level in the company so that he could follow them and um, upsell them a suit if they got in a promotion? Sale, any sales organization needs to do that. You track every customer. You track when you visited them, uh, all sorts of meat and potatoes information about their admin officer's name and phone number. When you can't get them, you know, you're, the admin assistant is your best friend. Uh, to a senior person, because you, you get on their good side, then, oh, I can track them down or track her down for you. So uh, Salesforce does that on a, on a software as a service model. You don't keep it in-house. They have the servers, and you just ship the data down there, and you log in to um, basically pull all of this information out. It's a service. Uh, but it's a, in this case, it's a global service model. And interestingly, they have challenges because if you store data in the states, the, uh, the Patriot Act allows the government to get anything. So there are no Swiss bankers using Salesforce.com. Mm -hmm. uh, minor glitch in their service model. Um, so uh, again, um, there, it can be high, a classic service model would be lab services. And again, many of the scientists that I deal with here are saying, you know, we'd like to set up doing a particular analysis because we do it in our lab and we see all sorts of colleagues who need it. And so the way they get into the market is say, well, I'll cut a deal with the prof and I'll use that uh, equipment and I'll pay a fee and I'll charge more and I'll offer this as a service. That's good, but that breaks down when you actually want to move out because now you find that that's a yeah, $500,000 piece of capital equipment. And get to this later in the lecture, who's gonna lend you 500,000 bucks to set that up and you know, can you generate the volume of business to, to carry that sort of capital? So some service businesses can be capital intensive. Salesforce.com has got a server farm sitting somewhere. And every time they get more customers, they need to add on servers. So, so there, are, there can be some capital costs, but probably not as high as the next category we'll we get to. But first, um, and you, sorry, that was, I should go no, back. that's okay. There's, I'm just... Uh, one comment I know you were going to make on, mm -hmm. on that one. So Salesforce.com has made an arrangement as part of their uh, corporate social responsibility to give 10 licenses free to nonprofits. So they're able to help the small nonprofits, which is great, but as you grow, you buy the licenses. So when they work with larger organizations like the Canadian Diabetes Association, they have hundreds of licenses with them. And so you give a little bit for free, you start to embed it, you begin to rely on it, and as you grow, you grow along with them. So that's an interesting kind of model. Now, how many people are familiar with Kiva? Anybody? Just, really, just a few. Okay, I'm a bit surprised. So Kiva is um, about micro lending. And in the social enterprise space, often uh, the service model is a broker model. So Kiva um, is based, it's actually operating out of the UK, but gives loans to people in developing countries. So you go online and you give a minimum $25 loan uh, to someone whose picture you see who needs a loan, because they're an entrepreneur. So if your interest is women in sewing, you find a group of women who have got a sewing collective and you support that, or a farmer, or someone who's developing something, shoes, and you think there's a, there's a real business opportunity there, you go online and you lend $25. Kiva then takes that money and links it up to a micro lender in that particular area. Um, the lender then makes the loan to the person that you choose, and then the repayment rate is something like 97%. It's incredible. The default rate in this is very, very low. And it's really about poverty reduction. It started, the whole movement of micro lending started 
with a guy called Mohammed Yunus who ended up winning a Nobel Prize for micro lending. So it's a huge area and it's spread around the world. You essentially then get your money back but without interest and then you can either take your $25 back or you can reinvest it in someone else and most of the time the money just continues to circulate. And I actually um, give these as Christmas gifts. Right? It's, it's a really nice little plug. Instead of something else that someone doesn't need, you can actually give them a gift certificate for $25, and they can invest in someone that's a fit with their mission somewhere in a developing country. So often, it's an intermediary role in the social enterprise space. It's a broker. And of course, the challenges are that quality control. You're, you're working way off site. You're working with other kinds of people. The micro lenders, you can't control that. You can't control who's going to emerge as an entrepreneur. But the way they've developed it and the way they've set up the systems, things seem to be working very well. The positive side is that you have great opportunity to scale. And that's really what it's about. It's about making impact and scaling. I should, uh, I need to warn you, you shouldn't let the venture capital community know about that because mm -hmm. the bulk of the investments they make are for profits. Inten intended to be that way. Sadly, most of them end up for not, prof not for profits, <laughs> and you may have them at your door. Um, so, um, okay. So, you know, Fuller Brushman, right? This is uh, the old days. Uh, this is the next level that we're going to talk about, which is products, which is someone showed up at your door, but things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, again, classic product organizations. Um, you know, the key characteristic, you are selling something, a widget, um, that uh, either you make or you contract someone to make. Uh, this could be pharmaceutical compounds, um, medical devices, consumer products, and the obvious examples, consumer products, P&G, uh, General Motors, and there's a good example of, it uh, doesn't matter how big you are as a product company, you can, you can uh, hit really bad times. I, it was too sad to put Nortel down there. Um, RIM is an example, though, of a product company that can just take off. And I think that's one key distinction between consulting and services, that if you hit the right product, you can just follow the classic hockey stick. It's slow, and then it takes off, and, you know, uh, iPhones, um, Blackberries, all those, uh, the whole cell phone industry, I mean, uh, well, I won't tell you what life was like when I and my colleague Andy over there were growing up, but none of these newfangled things were around. Um, I have, um, for example, mounted in my office, I have a slide rule. How many people here have actually ever used a slide rule? <laughs> no, all right, there's, there's a few my age. Um, you can't buy a slide rule, okay? For those who haven't used it, it's a, typically made of bamboo, and it's based on logarithms. You multiply, lo you multiply numbers by adding the logarithms of numbers. And that you can do linear, and it's literally a stick of bamboo that slides up and down. It is a slide rule. And if you were an engineer or a chemist 25, 30 years ago, it was de rigueur, meaning you just carried your slide rule with you. It, and it had been that way for a century. And in the course of probably 10 years, calculators came on board, and you just punched a bunch of numbers. You cannot buy a slide rule now outside of a basically historic artifact site. They're curiosities. So I have one framed on my desk to show how a, a product company or a product can just disappear and be replaced with something completely different. So Hewlett Packard calculators, they're thriving businesses uh, as a kick, but that too has now start, it started with a, uh, a few very high priced calculators. And now Casio, you can, you know, 795 will do what my old Hewlett Packard used to do. So product businesses always have to be reinventing themselves or they risk disappearing. Um, so some challenges. It can be expensive. Uh, if you have a new type of polystyrene and you want to go into production, 
let's try 50 million bucks to get yourself a plant. That's tough to do. You'll probably have a different business model that involves existing uh, plant capacity. Or nowadays, you will go and manufacture offshore. So the challenge in a lot of products is the cost of production and keeping that low to keep the cost of the product down. Um, development costs, again, this is classic. Pharmaceuticals you know, you know, is the extreme of a product. You're talking several hundred million dollars before you will get one nickel in sales. So very different game. Thankfully, not something I'm going to see any of you doing in your garage, because I'm not sure I want to be taking those drugs. But it's a, it's a product uh, pipeline. It's an expensive one. And there's a, there is a game, there is a pathway to follow for that sort of product. Uh, but as I say, if you get the right one, um, Valium, I'm trying to think of all the ones I've used. Um, you know, you, uh, these are blockbuster drugs. Okay. I'm glad you stopped at Valium. <laughs> I really, I really, uh, um, so let's talk about products in the social purpose space. So key characteristics. So it's really about selling a particular product that benefits a disadvantaged group or promotes a, a more ethical form of an existing product. So um, <clears throat> one of the ones you might see when you're out walking about is Bullfrog Power. Bullfrog Power is a pretty popular one. It's really about buying renewable electricity um, for your home or business to reduce your environmental Im impact. So that's one thing that I've noticed popping up more and more and more. And of course, they're out to make money, but they're also out, out to have an environmental impact. Vision Spring is an interesting uh, organization. It works in the developing countries, and they essentially take eyeglasses and make them available to people who need them. But they've taken the product out of the hands of the um, optometrist, and they've trained these vision entrepreneurs and they've been able to donate these glasses to them, but then they turn around and sell them for about $4, whereas historically they cost $40 to $60, which made them prohibitive. So they've got this great social mission, but they're able to make money uh, for these vision entrepreneurs, and they're then able to support their families and uh, look at alternative ways to do that. And one of my favorite ones is uh, one of our clients, me to we and they just had a big concert at uh, ACC. I don't know if anybody seen that or has a kid that was involved in this, but it's a big deal. Jason Bremer, did I say that right? Who knows this pop guy, he's like 15. It's a big deal, he was there. And uh, it was a, a really a huge deal. These guys are amazing. So this is the Kielbergers, they're Save the Children, and this is a program to support them. They really try to uh, position for kids daily lifestyle choices, but they uh, they do great things like trips where you go overseas and you build things. But really, what they've looked at is clothing. It's 100% organic. It's ethically made, and they also do this teas for trees. So every time you buy a T-shirt, they plant a tree. So there, they've got their environmental mission, their social mission, and their profit mission all tied in together. And these are really popular T-shirts. Um, they're, you can buy them online, and they're not cheap. So they know that they're not selling them at a low cost. They're selling them at what they think the market would bear. And these are basically middle to high income kids that are buying these. They have books that they sell. And for every book you buy, a book goes to um, a child in a developing country. And 50% of the proceeds from everything that Me to We sells goes back to save the children. They've got very low administrative costs. So if you are interested in this space at all, just click on the Me to We uh, site. It's a, I think there's actually a whole special going to be on Saturday night on them. Um, but it's a really entrepreneurial vision. I would hold them up against any entrepreneur. And the variety of ways they have to enable themselves to make money and make a difference is incredibly inspiring. Okay, now you're going to have to help me. Well, we're going to look. We're going to show. A quick, we talked about show me the money, and we just want to see how you know how popular this is in in pop culture. So, Wendy, if you could just give us a minute to uh, enjoy some pop culture here. What can I do for you, Rod? You just tell me what can I do for you. It's a very personal, very important thing. Are you ready, Jerry? I'm ready. I just want to make sure you're ready, brother. Here it is. Show me the money.
show you the money. Oh, no, no, you can do better than that, Jerry. I want you to say it with you with me in it, brother. Hey, I got Bob Sugar on the other line. I better hear you say it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Show you the money. Not, not show you. Show me the money. Show me the money. Yeah. Louder. Show me the money. That's it, brother, but you got to yell. Show me the money. I need to feel you, Jerry. Show me the money. Jerry, you better yell. Show me the money. Show me the money. Black man. I love the black man. Show me the money. I love black people. I love black people. What you gonna do, Jerry? Show me the money. Uh, congratulations, you're still my agent. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought that we would give you a sense of perspective. Like sometimes it is about showing you the money, but uh, there's. Um, some desperate ways to get that kind of money you can talk so to. So that uh, leads us to forms of financing. <laughs> um, and there's, there's really a, only a handful of ways of getting money to back a venture. Debt. Um, how many people know the three Fs? Any volunteers? Friends, family, and fools. Friends, family, and fools. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes called love money, if it's family. Um, yes, um, you can borrow, basically debt. You're borrowing from someone. Uh, you're going to give up an asset. Um, first thing some other investor is going to ask you, have you invested in this business? So um, if you say, oh, no, no, this is far too risky, um, you're not going to get very far. Um, you have to have some skin in the game. That's a fundamental rule. So where do you get that? From your friendly bank. Not their money. No, 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 no. They will lend against some equity. Yeah, your house is a pretty good start. They don't, see, nobody from CIBC here is here. They don't normally go after your firstborn, but uh, they will want an asset that will protect them. That's their job. Thank heavens, you know, witness um, events of the past year, it's a darn good thing. Our banks are pretty conservative. So, but that's basically you putting your assets on the line, because if your venture fails, well, you're going to be paying that mortgage off for a long time. So you can borrow. And uh, the other alternative is equity. So that's basically money that is given to you for a piece of the business. It's not repayable, but they own 10, 20, 50% of the business. And they will take 50% of all profits um, that you get, basically. So you are selling off your future, effectively, your future income in exchange for money today. Why would you do that? Because you can't get the money any other way. It's an expensive way to raise money, but it's often the only way to do so. Um, bootstrap is the other alternative. Start small, Get one contract, one customer, make a little money off of that, cycle, don't take much salary, cycle as much as you can into the business. I guess in social ventures they call it organic growth. There you go. Um, but grow slowly uh, as you come. Self, it's effectively self-financing. That, that works in some situations. I would not advise that in trying to launch something in, say, the um, um, wireless telecom business. Basically, that, you know, a model year there is about six months. If, you're, if it takes you more than six months to get an idea to the marketplace, it's already been displaced by something else. So it's not a sector that lends itself to a bootstrap business. In fact, if you get in, get a rich investor, a VC, you pour as much money as you, as you can in now uh, to get a beachhead with you know, the, uh, the cell phone companies, and then you're just on a treadmill, always, always, always keeping ahead of the game. But you can create a good business. 
doesn't, as I say, lend itself to slow and steady growth. Lots of other businesses do. Um, you know, different business sectors have different characteristics. So match your bootstrap one so that we'll tolerate slow growth. And so um, grants? Mm -hmm. So in the nonprofit world, uh, depending on how you decide to incorporate as a charity or a nonprofit organization, you're eligible for grants from foundations or donations, and you can get, um, get into a situation where you're able to give charitable receipts for those. Now, you're not going to get rich. You're going to get a salary, and you negotiate for that salary. But it's, an, it's a way to finance social purpose work. So we have some great foundations in this country, and of course, corporations also give. But the, the way you can make the most money, interestingly enough, is through social enterprise, although we don't hear that spoken about. We think about the government, we think about foundations, and we think about um, individuals giving money, but social enterprise is a great way to generate income for social purpose work. Now, in, the, uh, in Canada right now, you cannot give an equity investment in a charitable organization or a nonprofit. It's just not set up that way. The structure doesn't allow it. They've changed that in the UK, and there's something called KICKS, or community interest companies, and there's something in the US called LC3s, or limited liability companies, low profit limited liability companies. And in Canada, we're working very hard to change the regulatory environment that will actually enable people engaged in social purpose work to take equity, to allow them to scale. It's a challenge, but that's one of the things we're working on in our program. Um, OK, a little example of the difference uh, in how debt works or equity works. And I'm going to take the lemonade stand example. So you're eight years old and you need capital, 20 bucks to get your stand up in business. You have a choice. You can borrow um, from a sibling or you can take them in as a 50-50 partner. They're the financial partner, you're the operational partner. So let's, let's look at scenar three scenarios. It's, it rains for a weekend, it's cloudy, or it's brilliant hot sun. Okay, if it, so you've borrowed 20 bucks. If, um, if it rains and you've borrowed it, well, okay, you pay 10 bucks back to your sibling. So they've lost 10, you've got nothing for all your efforts because everything gets taken by the debt holder. If it was a 50-50 equity deal, hey, you split the 10 bucks, you as the entrepreneur, you got five, but uh, your partner, your, your lender, just lost 15, okay? Cloudy, you make 30 bucks. Um, the lender is even, they're now whole, and I'm ignoring things like interest and details like that. Um, the lender gets their 20 bucks back and you made 10. If, however, they were an equity partner, they still lost five bucks. You made 15, okay? This is not too bad. So, uh, because you got, you right, you split pre-profit, so you took 15 out of that 30 revenue, they took 15. Um, so there's still five bucks on the hole. It's a real sunny day. Now, uh, the lender is still even, because they're capped at getting their money back. Um, now you, you're starting to make some serious money, because you took everything else, the 30 bucks. Okay, if it's equity, um, okay, the partner um, makes makes five bucks. So they're finally making something because they've made five, they got 25. So that's, um, you know, they invested 20, they've made five. You got 25. Point here is that there's a different profile, risk reward profile for debt versus equity. Equity is higher risk, but ultimately equity can give a higher reward. Debt is more conservative. It's a lower risk, you get, they, the debt holder gets paid back first, but they don't make as much. So the risk, you know, risk and reward are intimately related. That's just the mathematics. The other subtle differences are 
when it's raining and your partner is an equity partner and you're saying, I don't think I'm really going to go outside, and they say, get your tail out there. You know, I'm your partner. I, every minute you're sitting inside here in the warm, I'm losing money. So, you know, I backed you to get out there and sell lemonade. Sell lemonade. So you are no longer the master or mistress of your own fate. You have a partner who put money in, and funny thing, people who put money in businesses expect to have a say. And, you know, the more they have to put in, the more they're going to expect to have a say. So, you know, do you want to be arguing with your sibling that you really don't feel like going outside? I'm trivializing this, but trust me, it happens all. It's a classic um, challenge between uh, investors, financial investors, and inventors, entrepreneurs, as to sometimes which opportunity should be followed first. Um, and um, there's a real challenge for control. We'll get into this a great deal more in a, in a lecture in the springtime about terms of investments, because we'll walk you through a lot of the details of the sorts of things that a financial partner will ask for in a shareholder's agreement, but that's a whole separate lecture. So where do you get uh, debt financing? And so we've already touched on this. You, you have to be the first line of, uh, of resource for bankrolling your, old venture, your own venture. Um, family and friends on the right there. Um, I guess down below that, uh, the general public. And, and I guess uh, banks on the left, which again is really just a surrogate for you until you have, again, the one exception, when you have an operational business that is making money and you can demonstrate two successful quarters with positive EBITDA, earnings before interest and taxes, then the bank will start looking at lending you money to support an operating line of credit. First thing typically will be financing your sales and your receivables. But the, uh, you know, the more money you're turning over, the more the bank is now willing to, to bankroll your business independent of you. Um, so I just want to say the bottom one could also be crowdsourcing, which is going back to that micro lending example, which is a lot of people giving a little bit. You think about um, some opportunities there. You can think about uh, Barack Obama's fundraising campaign, really famous for not getting those huge, huge gifts, but getting an awful lot of people to give a little bit of money, and that ended up being incredibly successful for him. And, and that actually touches on something that is interesting now with the use of the internet. You know, before you used to have to physically visit everybody who you might uh, hit up for money. And uh, you know, classic there was Trivial Pursuits. They are legendary. They actually hit up some guy in a bar um, who lent them, I think, $10,000. And you know, one happy camper, because that $10,000 became worth multi-millions. That's in the fool's category, or maybe <laughs> not the fool's category in that particular case. Um, but in terms of crowdsourcing, there are interesting things that um, um, record producers or software producers can do. For example, if you want to develop a piece of software, a consumer software, but you don't have the money to actually develop it, you can create a rough beta model, sell it to people for, yeah, 10 bucks, with a promise that when it's finished, they will get the final one, and they won't just get a $10 credit towards that, they get a $25 credit towards that. So from a, you know, online, you can, you can uh, hit, if it's popular enough, you can generate, if not enough money to do it, enough to go to uh, an investor. And when they say, how do you know people will want this? You say, well, I've had, you know, 10,000 people already put 10 bucks down. 
and I know they'll buy the finished ones. So there's guaranteed revenue. So you can get the rest of the money because you've proven the markets and it becomes self-fulfilling. Now you can build the software code, ship it out to that market, and you're off to the races. So that's the power of crowdsourcing money. And there's a lot of clever things that are being done with records and, and, or, or you know, uh, tunes that, uh, that utilize uh, sort of the power of reaching out to multiple people for small amounts. So uh, sources of equity. We've talked a bit about debt. Again, friends, family, and fools, if they don't lend, they become an investor. Angels, they often prefer to be known as high net worth individuals. Basically, these are folks who have cashed in. There was a, in Ottawa, there was a wonderful period when a lot of senior executives from Nortel cashed in at 160, 170 bucks a chair and were instantly multimillionaires. Um, so, looking for something to do, they would invest in opportunities. Traditionally, though, angels invest in areas that they understand, which is why there was a flurry of small uh, telecom um, device companies in Ottawa, because they had angels who knew the sector and were comfortable betting on a particular product. Um, they're not that comfortable moving into something really strange. Um, most of us are not happy investing money in something we don't really understand. It's a natural response. They can, what they can do, though, because they have domain experience, they can be more than just a financial backer. They can open doors for you because they know the folks. And that's a huge thing that an angel can offer to an, an early stage venture. Um, uh, there's a www.angelinvestor.ca, it's the um, National Angel Corporation Organization, NACO, um, who have a website, and there are angel groups across the province. Uh, Maple Leaf Angels are a good local one, and actually Mars has just started up an angel group. Um, venture capital funds, the classic source of money, which is not very healthy right now. Um, just remember, funds tend to specialize. Again, they like to get domain experience in an area, and they really are not comfortable going somewhere else. So you'll have software companies. You'll have life sciences companies. Do your homework. Don't go and try and sell a software idea to a life sciences company, because it's an absolute waste of time. You know, if you're approaching an investor, and the same is true with an angel, easier with a VC fund because they have websites and, and a lot of public information. Look at their portfolio. See what companies they have looked in. And if you can go and say, wow, if you like this, boy, you're going to like me. Okay? Understand what flavors they like. Um, and don't waste your time trying to sell something, Harry would say you know, to a customer who's not interested in that particular product. Uh, and so there is a Canadian Venture Capital Association. Their offices are just across the hall, up on the first floor. You can go to their websites, and they have links to all of the uh, VC funds uh, across the country. And again, we will come back in the spring in the module about raising money and talk a lot more about the care and feeding of uh, venture funds and angels. Um, so, special sources, and to those of you who are still associated with a university or a hospital, um, you can get the, the magic thing that you want is non-dilutive funding, which means somebody gives you money and doesn't take anything in return. You can get that from um, 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 uh, uh, the um, uh, CH, um, CHRI, you can get it from NSERC. Uh, they both have proof of principle or idea to innovation type grants, uh, and they are grants, and you can use that to develop your idea and get it closer to the marketplace. That's what those are set up for. And so I strongly advise uh, going after those uh, non-dilutive funds. In um, uh, this IRAP, most folks have heard of uh, Industrial Research Assistance Program managed by NRC. 
They have um, field agents across the country. They will uh, fund yeah, 30 to 50 percent of technical development programs in private companies. And so um, they, they've done a lot of good things uh, for little startup uh, companies. So that's non-dilutive. Uh, you, have, you have to pick up half the cost, but again, it just, it costs the, uh, it, it reduces by a factor of two, practically, the amount of dilutive money you have to take in, and that's a, a good thing. And so. so just quickly, uh, foundations uh, tend to give money to charities or nonprofits. If you have an idea and you want to partner with a charity or nonprofit, you may be eligible for foundation funding. Uh, we mentioned the Gates Foundation. They've just announced a $400 million fund. And again, historically, this is grants. What they're looking at now is debt. They're actually looking to be able to make loans. Or this is one of my favorite new terms, groans, which is a combination grant and loan uh, to those engaged in social purpose work. And sometimes it will be, you know, you, you get a grant first to do a proof of concept. And then once they feel they've got a relationship with you, they'll turn that into some form of a, of a loan. In Canada, there's a huge campaign by the Community Foundations of Canada to begin to uh, look at not just grants, but actually loans. And what's happening is um, there's a, a foundation in Edmonton that just uh, decided to change from grants to loans. And they did so much better on their repayment of those loans to social enterprises than they did with the investments recently, where they lost like 14%, you know, whereas they made 5% on the loans that they made to these social investments. So because of the timing, we're able to capitalize on that and look at what we call social finance or alternative ways of funding social purpose work. Okay, I'm going to be mindful of the time mm -hmm. so we don't keep people from uh, dinner too mm -hmm. long. Just a quick mention on the financing life cycle. And again, this is something we will revisit. Um, you need to, to think about um, what you are doing. You, you, classic stages, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a social purpose or a for-profit business. Start with an idea, create a startup, you enter a growth phase, and uh, again, if your target is really going big, you then enter expansion mode, taking over the world. Um, this is the process basically of risk reduction. You start out with an extremely risky business. It's an unproven idea or technology. Frankly, it's probably an unproven management team. And nobody really knows if anybody wants the product or service. So that's the green line. What you're doing is you're taking investment, in one form or another, and you're reducing that risk down. At some point, you actually have a product, and you have a customer, and you have revenues. And we won't get into public markets, because right now that's just theoretical. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, you can move through angels, seed funds or, or uh, loans uh, from foundations. If you want to get really bigger, then you are talking about venture capital or what is increasingly becoming available, philanthropic capital, which is a, a, um, uh, a non-vulture capital model uh, where social purpose uh, ventures are backed by philanthropists. Um, so, the, um, this is a good model, but everyone shows the red hockey stick. What typically happens, though, is something like that. And just be aware that you're still burning up capital, doesn't matter what the venture is, and you're not earning enough. Uh, and now you have a big disconnect from your backers with the reality, and at some point, it's at this stage that the backers say, enough, the market doesn't really like this, I'm pulling the plug on this. Because it's not sustainable. And again, that's the sustainable uh, social business or sustainable conventional business. The emphasis is sustainability. People's patients run out of constantly putting money into things without seeing it actually catch on. And uh, you know, a better model in that case is, again, the bootstrap model, 
that says you're not burning a lot of people's cash. You keep your burn rates more in line with your revenues. And you don't increase the burn until you've got the, the, the justification from customer traction. So those are just some kind of nuts and bolts in, in this. And again, we will get into this in quite a bit more detail. Um, so yeah, investors or backers are concerned about risk. Uh, I like to think for a conventional venture of four risks. The technology risk. Basically, does it work? Uh, what stage is it at? Is it just a concept and you at least demonstrated it in a garage or on the bench? Or have you got a sweet working prototype that uh, will really impress people? So where are you on the stage of technology risk and how much will that development co path cost? And, and do you really understand your competition? So does it work? IP risk, do you want to, you should protect this to gain assist in sustainability. So is it patentable? And again, we're going to have a lecture talking about this. Uh, is it patent, know-how, software? Um, so does it work? Can you protect it? Um, uh, third one, does anybody care outside of your immediate family who have lent you money? Um, What's the market size? What are the dynamics? Um, again, your competition. Is there a clear route to the markets? Everybody wants to sell apps on iPhones. I can introduce you to senior executives from the telcos who say, no, we turn down 99 out of 100. Everybody wants our platform to get their app out there. And, you know, no, we don't clutter up our platform. We only take a small handful. So that's a route to market. You don't get your app on someone's cell phone. It's pretty useless. And you can't go in competition. Uh, so there are, there are basically gatekeepers sometimes. Sometimes you have to say, fine, uh, maybe I will set up an alternative channel if they're not smart enough. High risk, very expensive you can sometimes pull it off. Um, so, you know, the, the fourth risk, it works, you can protect it, uh, you got customers who love it. Can you actually manage a business? You know, do you have what it takes to coordinate production, development of next generation technology, a sales team, um, everything that it takes to run a successful business. Um, you may be a brilliant inventor, or you have a concept for a, a social venture that you're passionate about. If you can't make it happen, then you have a problem. And you know, everybody in the investment business knows of companies that just basically blew it because of a poor management team. Good product, blew a window of opportunity, got some excitement, encouraged competition, and just then got overtaken because they couldn't seize the moment. They weren't smart enough to arrange financing for customers and all sorts of things like that. So that's a key one, and that's the key fourth risk for a conventional business. And all of those apply in the social purpose world as well, except for the other issue you really have to be concerned about is mission drift. It's very easy if you've got a double or triple bottom line to focus on making the money. That's where you put the resources because you need to generate that kind of income, but then you lose the focus on your social mission or your environmental mission. Of course, all the execution risks are there. A lot of people go into social purpose work for a personal reason. They're motivated because of something that personally happened to them or something in their family. But really, do you understand the market? Does it work? All the things that Tony said. And of course, a lot of people don't know this marketplace. It's emergent. And in an emergent field, you're the real entrepreneur. You're the one making all the rules. And there's a lot of challenges, and it can be quite exhausting around that. There's just some general skepticism because people don't know what it is. So there's a lot of work to even just get people to understand what it is you're talking about, although there is a huge trend in what we call impact investing. Investors coming in and saying, we want to impact uh, not just in terms of the financial return, but we want to see a um, difference in the world. We want to make a difference, and we're 
pleased to support you around that. So we'll even take less return financially if we can get a social or environmental return. Lots of momentum, lots of interesting stuff, but we're sure you're all hungry. And so we're just gonna wrap up now, Tony? Yes, um, uh, we're obviously welcome questions. Either there are mics on either side or for those who wanna come up after, uh, please feel free to do so. Over to you. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Classic problem. Um, it's uh, it's one of those things. It's a game. You have to, you know, show enough to win, uh, but not give it all away. What I advise people: tell tell a potential customer, right? You gotta you gotta sell them on on the idea before you got the product. You got you, that's your way of testing whether there's interest. Tell them what it will do for them without telling them how it will do it. Because you're not be able to be able to patent what it will do for them probably. What you will get as a patent is you know, how it delivers this. So get them excited about what it enables them. And you get enough resonance that yes, that's exciting, that it helps tell you that yes, I should really patent this. Um, you know, the, my, again, my advice is it's fairly cheap insurance. Uh, initial filing is somewhere 7 to 10K to do a pretty good job. And, you know, this is classic where I say, if you're not willing to put that, if you can't scrape up 7,000 bucks to get a basic patent filed, you're going to have a real, real challenge. And so if you, if you got enough comfort yeah, I don't have any time for vanity patents. Lots of people do those. You know the stats. One out of every hundred or so patents actually goes on to make anybody any money. And so it's a, it's a matter of if you're confident enough, get it. You still don't disclose on the first date. Um, you, again, emphasize what it will do for them. If they start to get serious, now you've got something you can say, sign a confidentiality agreement, and I will send you my patent application. Because again, a patent, can e depending on the sector, could easily be three or four years before it gets through the US patent office. You need to be out in the marketplace. But again, if you offer it for sale, that is equivalent to a disclosure. <laughs> So you can't go on the market and sell for six months or so to see that something is there. That's equivalent to a disclosure. And in all of the world, except the US and Canada, you just lost all rights to patents. And you're within the one year grace period that the states and Canada give you. But you just lost at least half of your market, assuming you're going global. So. So we do have a whole session on intellectual property. And yes, we and do. That kind of uh, that's uh, early in the new year. Uh, Arshia Tabrizi uh, talking about uh, basically patents, uh, trademarks um, as a business tool, not just for vanity. Sorry. OK, so I was just, um, just curious about government support in regards to the one-for-one -one business model um, you know, with the social responsibility there. You know, like I'm really interested in the whole concept, but the profit part of it, kind of like a Salesforce model. I believe Salesforce does the same thing. So, so what are like what type of government support is there for that in terms of Canada? Oh, it completely depends, right? I mean, okay. so if you are in, involved with a larger organization and there's a lot of government grants that are available for a lot of different programs, we could actually do some research on that for you if you're interested. We have a great okay. market research area and I can chat with you about that offline. Okay, for great, sure. thanks. Okay. And, and you, uh, just to emphasize, if it's clean tech, right. there's a whole federal government organization called Sustainable Development mm -hmm. Technology Canada and they have hundreds of millions of dollars a year to, and it's a, it's a bit of a, a grown? Mm -hmm. it, it's a, you know, grant some grant, some loan, but, but they'll do um, 
easily five or ten million dollars to help you get a pilot plant right. established to prove out an environmental technology. So that's that's a hot sector. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so there's lots of money in that. I don't think yeah. it's quite as good in many others. No, it's hot right now. Thank you. Okay. Oh, um, I shouldn't admit this, but there's tons of books that I've stolen from for, the, for this lecture, for the, the uh, traditional business side. Um, there's The Art of the Start is, um, is a good one, um, and I'm blanking on the author's name. That's quite a new and... Kai, Guy Kawasaki, thank you. <laughs> It's a, uh, that's a, a pretty good uh, intro uh, to starting companies. Um, we, d you know, I did mention at the beginning, we, are, you know, we will have a website with a whole raft of, of detailed uh, kind of workbooks on that, but that's not quite launched yet. If we think of others. Mm -hmm. um, There's one that I'm reading right now called Forces for Good, Leslie Crestfield. It's about uh, six factors of high impact nonprofits. And interestingly enough, one of the first ones she talks about is an alliance between for-profit and not-for-profits and how those are the most impactful. It's really quite interesting. So if you're interested in really, really seeing scale. Um, another one uh, one of my colleagues wrote is called Getting to Maybe. Her name is Frances Wesley. Uh, it's a really interesting book looking at social innovation writ large and how you make those kind of differences. And I think one thing we did say we would try and do is when we post the slides, we'll tack on a slide with any thoughts that we've had of, of other books. Absolutely. Uh, rather than sort of post them here and have people frantically try to write down titles. It, it'll be there online when you want it. Thank you. Uh, I, can I just ask a small question? Uh, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, I just had uh, one or two things if I could share with you. You mentioned four market risks, four types of risk. I thought probably we could have added one or two more. One was the financial risk. What is the guarantee of getting continued funding, including from friends, family, and fools? And the other one was the management risk, the risk of two brothers fighting during the pendency of the project. That was question number one. I would lump the latter yeah, one I, into generally one um, execution. execution. So, Sorry. Yeah. If I could, you know, I could share with you. The other one was. What are the exit policies for venture capitalists? See, what happens is that uh, uh, we are talking of equity only if it is an incorporated venture. Usually, we start off with a proprietor, then we go into an LLP. And the problem with the partners, whether it's a limited partnership or unlimited, when you take venture or angel, uh, the partnership has to account it as an advance, even if it's without interest. So when we talk of equity, it will essentially be only an incorporated company. Secondly, mm -hmm. is that if, uh, if it's not a coated, it's not a coated stock, even if it's in TSX Venture, I'm talking of, you know, it, because you have to graduate to TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange. We have the TSX Venture, which is a primary, where you have a widely held public limited company. But if somebody wishes to incorporate a private limited company, the angel has to exit. And at that time, you have to evaluate the share. So how would you do it? At what premium would it be done? Would it be taken as a, as a lump sum goodwill or what? And that was these two issues which I thought I could. Okay, do. number of questions in there. You're, you. you're absolutely right about the yeah, financial yeah, risk. Because yeah. these days, yeah. that is very real, that you'll get, you'll follow your pathway, but you won't find follow on investment. So that's a good catch. That's, and that's a, you know, your management may be working well, and the product is working, yeah. but. Uh, there's just not enough money to finance it. And that's, yeah, that's a, that's a real risk. Again, I would say brothers fighting is I'd lump under execution. To me, execution risk is management miss, risk. Yeah. They, and basically, management team has not got its act together for any number of reasons, including fighting. They don't have to be brothers. They could be co-founders. At right, and uh, one of them disagrees with the other, and the financial backers agree with one. Now you have major poison in your core team, and uh, so so that's you know that's to me execution and and management. Your question about venture capital and exits, again, this 
this is, a, is actually a very important point when you're taking venture and to a certain extent angel money. Again, make certain that your desires and life desires uh, match those of your investors because most private venture funds are a 10-year uh, time-limited capital pool. And a bunch of funds or wealthy individuals put their money in on day one. It's actually drawn out over years, but make a commitment. Uh, and the intent is there will be a period of investing in opportunities, three or four years. Then the next three or four years will be growth of those opportunities. And then the last few years will be exiting because they do not want to clip dividend coupons. So you may decide, this is my life. Well, you need a mechanism to get them out because their model is invest, grow, exit. Pub going public used to be the classic route because after a six month hold period, hey, they sell their shares, they're happy, you're still in the company. That hasn't happened much in the past five years. So, but a, a, a venture capital investor who's serious will ask you before they invest, what's your exit strategy? Today it's more a, basically a trade sale. Intel will buy you. That can be very good for you. Uh, but it's an exit. And as you as the inventor, do you want to work for Intel? Because they'll take your company over and make it a division. And part of the condition of taking it over is that you stay there for minimum of a year. And again, it's classic. The day after the year is up, the founder's out of there. Because the reason they started their own company to start with is they didn't want to work for a big corporation. So, but uh, VCs, the model is exit. And if, there's, if you don't want to sell, then you have a real challenge with them. Unless you can find a way, you know, you can buy them out, which entails hopefully raising a large amount of money because your venture is worth a lot, but you've got to raise that to take them out in valuation. Um, if it's a profitable uh, business that has several years of profit under its belt, they're pretty standard formula for extrapolating growth and assuming, you know, that type of business gets a three times earning multiple, as that one only gets a 1.5 times multiple. If you're pre-revenue, you know, argue with them, it's very tough to put a value on. You can hire a third party uh, valuator, but the standard economic tools don't work when you've got no uh, revenue traction. Um, and mind you, you haven't got revenue traction in 10 years. Um, it's probably not going to be worth very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.